take a minute and uh, observe and write down any observations that you have of this video uh, as it plays you'll notice there's a few things that kind of change in it um, keep your eyes down towards the bottom of the um, rock area uh, make some general observations write them down inside your warm-up sheet So salmon in the classroom. Um, there became a problem in the Great Lakes uh, ecosystem a number of years back, and the problem was elwives. Uh, elwives were not native to the Great Lakes, so they're an exotic species. Um, they were native to the ocean, but they, they can live inside of fresh water. Uh, specifically, the way that they were introduced, they came through the Welland Canal. Uh, which is the canal that runs around Niagara Falls. 
Uh, obviously, with Niagara Falls in the way, there's not any fish that are able to swim up the falls in order to get into our Great Lakes ecosystem. So when we created the well and canal for ships and other things to get around uh, Niagara Falls, um, some non-native species were able to do that as well. Uh, so basically what happened is alewives came through the well and canal, they swam all the way around Niagara Falls, and they went right to Lake Erie. Um, the alewife, alewife population um, basically exploded, just overproduction, uh, overpopulation. They reproduced really well in the Great Lakes. They didn't have any predators to begin with, and so they just uh, continued to grow and reproduce. and. Um, because of the millions upon millions of elwives that were found, uh, we ended up with, with occasional die-offs. And these die-offs would occur because of things like starvation or disease. Um, eventually a population gets so large and the resources aren't available to sustain that population. Uh, and that's exactly what happened with our elwives in our state. Um, so what ended up happening was every time people would go to the beach, uh, and there would be a die-off, there'd be these massive areas of dead elwives just that floated up on the, on the shoreline that just littered the beaches everywhere. You can see in the two pictures on this slide where uh, there's elwives that are just basically floating up. Um, and you can imagine the smell of dead fish uh, on a massive scale when they're all dying like that. Uh, beaches ended up um, becoming basically havens for uh, a these these bodies of elwives to just break down and rot and smell and um, seagulls loved them and the seagull population got higher because they had easy pickings for eating these dead elwives but um, a lot of uh, a lot of problems were associated with them especially the problem of it not being great for tourism people didn't want to visit the beaches uh, which is what Michigan's really known for so the solution um, we decided on behalf of one non-native species to introduce another non-native species. Um, and the species that we decided to introduce were cohos and king salmon, or chinook salmon. Um, and they were imported from the Pacific Northwest, from Washington, Oregon, all the way up uh, the Canadian, British Columbian area, all the way up and into um, Alaska you can find these species. Uh, so they were imported from that area of the world. Um, and they were brought here to basically eat the elwives. They, we wanted to get rid of the population of elwives, or at least control the population of elwives, and that was the fix for it. Um, salmon are cold-blooded. Their body temperature matches the temperature of the surrounding water, so uh, cold, deep water in Lake Michigan and our other Great Lakes was ideal for salmon. Uh, the lifespan for salmon is three to five years. Uh, when we're talking about the Great Lakes ecosystem, we usually focus in on a life cycle of being uh, three years, um, but salmon in the Great Lakes can go four or five years old before they die, before they um, end up finalizing their life cycle. They don't repopulate very well in Michigan, okay? So uh, they don't do a very good job of keeping their population sustainable. Um, our, the populations of salmon, coho, and king salmon in Michigan and throughout the Great Lakes region, it's really sustained through uh, hatchery programs in our state and in other states. Wisconsin has a hatchery uh, program. Um, Ontario, Canada has some hatchery programs. Um, and that's really the big ones for the Great Lakes region as far as states and then the Canadian government go. So the question is, did it work? Uh, salmon help to control the elwife population. They help to keep our beaches clean. Uh, you very rarely will go to the beach anymore where you find a population of dead elwives, uh, an uh, elwife die-off. Uh, so that's not anything that we see very often anymore. Um, and it also created an entire economy of sports fishing. Um, so it's become this major economy inside of our state. Um, many people throughout the country come to the Great Lakes to sport fish for salmon and uh, sport fish for coho um, and king salmon. Uh, so it's definitely a money maker for our state. Um, salmon have become a food source for people. So think about uh, the last time you had smoked fish. Um, that would be a food source. A lot of times people smoke salmon or they, uh, they bake salmon. So uh, definitely a food source for us. Um, even though they were originally introduced species, currently they're very important to our ecosystem. Um, they are extremely important for the main maintenance or the maintaining of that elwife population. 
Uh, and they, they limit some populations of other species of fish in the Great Lakes as well. Uh, they're basically the predator species. They are the species that's the top of the food chain in our, in our Great Lakes. And then something just kind of keep in mind, um, you keep hearing about Asian carp and Asian carp possibly making it into the Great Lakes. And one of those questions out there right now is, will that threaten um, the salmon and the other trout species? Will it threaten their populations in our state and in the Great Lakes states? Uh, so that's one of those questions that's out there currently. Uh, so the salmon life cycle. Salmon life cycle is really just a big circle. You end up with two returning spawning adult salmon. Um, those two adult salmon will lay around 4,000 eggs. Uh, the female lays them in gravel. Uh, the male comes uh, behind the area where she's laying eggs, fertilizes the eggs, um, and the eggs basically are buried inside of the gravel where they can grow, develop, um, hatch. And then after they hatch, those salmon, the fry, the small babies, will stay inside of the river for a short amount of time where they uh, continue to grow and eat and uh, find resources to become bigger before migrating out to our Great Lakes. Um, there are, for every 4,000 eggs that are laid, there's about 800 fry that will hatch. They'll actually be viable uh, babies. Um, but as we know in nature, other organisms start to eat them. They are a food source to other things, birds especially, uh, things like great blue heron, um, kingfishers, uh, a number of other species of birds eat them. And even uh, they're even eaten by certain insects. Um, they are... Uh, eaten by some mammals like mink. Uh, so they're definitely a food source when they're young to sustaining the ecosystem. Um, those 800 fry will then become 200 smolts. And you'll notice this slide, this picture right here says 200 smolts go to sea. In the Great Lakes we're really just going to focus in on the fact that our smolts in the Great Lakes migrate to Lake Michigan or to one of the Great Lakes and they live their life out there we don't have salmon that migrate all the way out through the St. Lawrence Seaway and out into the Atlantic Ocean. The fish that are here are landlocked, meaning that they are trapped by land. They aren't able to migrate all the way out to the ocean. They stay in the Great Lakes region. Uh, and then for every 200 smolts that actually go into the Great Lakes, uh, 10 of them will, re will reach adulthood. Um, and that includes the fish that are out in, um, out in say, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, uh, it could be Lake Superior, Lake Erie. Uh, those fish will reach adulthood. And after they re reach adulthood, for every 10 that reach adulthood, two will return to spawn again. Um, it's important to note that once a fish reaches adulthood, there's a number of factors that can cause those organisms to, uh, to die. Could be fishing, could be charter boat captains going out and fishing for salmon. Uh, it could be birds of prey. Uh, some birds of prey like eagles and ospreys will uh, pick them up as they maybe aren't necessarily any bigger than just a couple pounds, um, but they can pick them up and they can uh, eat them. And then disease plays into it and other things like parasites uh, and sea lampreys is another example for uh, an organism that will, um, that will cause death of, of adult salmon. So eggs. Uh, in this life cycle, salmon eggs are laid in the fall. Uh, the, the male and female come into the river system. Um, they uh, lay their eggs usually in a gravel area. Uh, usually those eggs will hatch around mid-December. So it takes 30 to 60 days for those eggs to eventually hatch. And this strictly depends on water temperature. Uh, if water temperature is warmer, then the eggs hatch earlier. If water temperature is colder, then it takes a little bit longer for those eggs to hatch. Um, the live eggs are orange. They usually have two uh, eyes. Uh, and there's usually a few red blood vessels, as you can see inside of this picture. When we get our eggs from the hatchery, they are what are called eyed eggs. So they've already developed to the point where uh, we can tell by looking at it that that embryo inside of the egg is viable. It, it, it will probably hatch. Um, on occasion, as they do start hatching, we'll notice some abnormalities among them. Some of them end up with different types of diseases that can cause the, uh, the young um, fish to die. But usually when we get them as eggs, 
it's a little easier to keep them alive once they're eyed. If we were to go up and pick uh, eggs up that were just fertilized from the hatchery where they, uh, where they collect uh, salmon and fertilize the eggs, there would be a lot less chance of those, uh, those eggs being able to hatch in our tank. They, they definitely die a little bit easier. Um, dead eggs float in salt water. So live eggs sink to the bottom in salt water. So uh, this is one way in which the hatchery program kind of keeps track of live and dead eggs. They, uh, they can actually go in and a job for somebody working for the Department of Natural Resources is to actually go in after all of these eggs have been fertilized, add a slight amount of saline water to it, and start scooping out all of the dead eggs that are floating. Um, and then as this process continues, as the uh, eggs start getting eyed, uh, they'll actually whiten up as they die, and an individual is supposed to go in there, count out, and remove all of the eggs that are not viable anymore, that are, gonna, that are dead or are in the process of dying. So um, kind of a labor-intensive job, but it is a job that people do. Um, eggs, as I mentioned earlier, they're hidden under gravel 6 to 12, 24 inches deep. Uh, and it's in cold water, and that helps to protect them from light and predators. Uh, the alluvin. Um, this is the stage that we will see our salmon in as soon as they hatch. Um, so there's a yolk sac that kind of hangs off the bottom of our fish. Um, it is a nutrient-rich yolk sac. Um, so it's basically a sack lunch that's packed by its mom, and that that uh, small fish will absorb it over a period of about four weeks. Um, as it absorbs it, it will continue to grow. Once that uh, yolk sac is completely absorbed, uh, then the fish will start feeding. Um, and in this stage, oxygen actually goes right through the body into that long uh, vein that you can see right down the middle of the, f of the fish. Uh, so it's kind of this long vein right through here. Uh, so the gills really aren't working at this stage yet. Um, they actually take in oxygen without the use of gills when they're that small. Um, the alluvin, uh, they remain buried in the gravel to avoid predators and light. And then when the yolk sac is gone, they have to pu push up through the gravel and they become fry. So it's important to realize that um, the, the alluvin... That is the stage where they have hatched, but they really are still carrying that egg with them, and they st they will stay underneath the gravel. Fry is the stage where that young salmon has actually emerged through uh, the gravel, and it's actually starting to swim around in the water column. So fry eat small aquatic invertebrates, i.e. bugs. Um, they eat uh, a number of other insects, uh, larvae that are swimming around inside of the water as well. Um, they live in backwater pools, and usually it's kind of like right along the edge of uh, rivers or in areas where there's smaller streams where they can get away from predators. Uh, usually those pools are a little bit slower than the main current of the river because obviously if you're a real small fry floating around in the middle of the river, the river's going to move you pretty easily. Uh, so they usually kind of congregate in some slower moving uh, areas of water. Uh, that is still cold. It can't be warm water. At this point, they start to develop dark spots or dark lines called par marks. And those par marks are used for camouflage. So typically when we think of salmon, we think of salmon as being really bright silver. Uh, they don't have very many marks on them. Um, but it's important for these fry when they're small to have dark marks on them because if they're silver, silvery and it's easy for them to be seen and they aren't blending into the environment very well, they're easy pickings for birds of prey uh, and any other predator that might be uh, hanging out along the edge of the river. So this little video is just simply showing a, a group of fry as they're swimming back and forth. Um, these fish might even be classified uh, as fingerlings. They do look a little bit longer, which fingerling is the next stage of life uh, that we'll talk about on the next slide. But you can kind of see them in a big group. Uh, think about what maybe is a benefit of these fry being in big groups. Um, why would it be important to be in a big group? Can 
So fingerlings. Fingerlings are about the length of a finger. They live in uh, riffles of the stream. So that's kind of the areas where um, there's some more water movement. They aren't necessarily going to be hanging out right along the shallows or shorelines and all that kind of thing. Um, it helps to camouflage them because at this point they've started to lighten up. Their par marks kind of start to fade a little bit. They become more silvery. Uh, and so it's important for them to find areas in the water column where they can blend in. And usually the riffles are an area where that occurs because water tends to bend light and it causes reflection. When you have bright reflective spots in water uh, and a fish that is in that area and it's reflecting a little bit too, it's not quite as obvious. Um, they eat a variety of aquatic uh, invertebrates, caddisflies, um, could be caddisfly larvae or even caddisflies, dragonfly larvae, uh, midgefly larvae. There's a number of other invertebrates that uh, we'll talk about later that they eat. A smolt. A smolt is the period of time uh, where the fry or the uh, fingerlings start to go through this, uh, this change. Smolting is the process where they actually uh, imprint on the chemical smell or chemical signal of the, of the body of water that they're in. Uh, so they basically get familiar with its home stream. Uh, this is important for later on in life because this smolting process allows these fish to realize uh, the location that they need to return to to spawn. Most fish, most salmon, will return to the same exact river, if not the same exact gravel bed, uh, that they spawned, that they were born in, that they their parents spawned in. So um, they, the smolting process allows them to kind of imprint on that environment so they can return to it. Uh, and then also power marks continue to disappear at this smolting process. It's important for us to try to get our fish into a river prior to the smolting process because if our fish imprint on uh, the tank water, the tank water might be quite a bit different from the water body that... Um, that we actually released the fish in. Uh, the, the chemical, the chemistry, the makeup of that water might be so different that our salmon fry um, would decide to return to a completely different river, a completely different body of water. Um, they turn silverly, silvery and they tend to kind of hang out on the bottom. Um, the top of their body kind of gets a little bit darker um, because if you're looking down on a fish from the top, uh, you're usually looking at darker water below, so it's important for them to blend in. When looking down from above, uh, they need to have dark on top. And then from the bottom up, they'll be kind of a silvery color, because if you were a predator underneath the salmon looking up, it, you would see the sky, and so it would look lighter up above, and those fish would blend in more uh, with that lighter color on the bottom. Adult salmon, they spend three to four years, sometimes five years, uh, out in Lake Michigan. Uh, they typically follow food sources, so those L-wives. They kind of follow those L-wives in a big circle as they move around uh, Lake Michigan or any other of the, of the Great Lakes. They are the top predator in Lake Michigan. They eat L-wives and other small fish. And during this adult stage when they're living in the Great Lakes, this is the period of time where they do, they do their largest amount of growing. A spawner. A spawner is a fish that returns to its home river in order to reproduce. Um, they seek out that chemical imprint, uh, and that chemical imprint helps them to identify uh, exactly where they should spawn. Because obviously the area that they grew up in, the area that they were born in, is probably going to be a beneficial area to raise your own young in, um, or let your own young grow up in. If you were able to survive in that environment, then the organisms that come from your DNA are probably going to be able to survive in that environment as well. Um, once a salmon enters the river, they no longer feed. And when I say they no longer feed, I don't want you to misunderstand that. Yes, you can go catch salmon with a fishing pole inside of a, inside of a river once they uh, have gone into the river. And yes, salmon do bite once they've gotten into the river. When I say that they don't really eat, they don't really eat out of the necessity of, to survive. All of the blood flow inside of a salmon, it stops going to the digestive system once they've returned to the river system. So the digestive system starts to shut down. And all of that blood and all that nutrients in the body is then used to uh, fuel 
the reproductive system. And so eggs get larger, um, the sperm in the males tends to, the, the, uh, the testes start to develop more, more fully, uh, which then allows these fish to reproduce. Um, they typically swim upstream to the location where they were hatched. Uh, the female then lays its eggs in a red, which is basically a nest. And you can see in the bottom picture here where there's that area that's kind of lighter gravel. That would be the area that was considered, would be considered a red. Um, a male deposits milt or sperm on top of the eggs, and that fertilizes the eggs. Um, there's a number of changes that occur as I kind of alluded to earlier in salmon as they're spawning. Um, they change color. So they change color from a silver to kind of a reddish pink. So this picture on the top kind of gives a good representation of, of the color change that will occur. Um, the males specifically end up with a hooked jaw or a kipe. Um, so they get this physical change. And again, in that top picture, you can see that, that big hooked jaw down on the bottom. Um, the bottom jaw hooks upward. And then usually within about two weeks of entering the river, those salmon will die. Uh, this is very useful to the Great Lakes ecosystem because those fish that die are then supplied, uh, their nutrients is supplied back to the ecosystem. Um, there might be bears running around in the woods that pick up, bear, or pick up the, the fish and uh, eat the fish and then bears do what bears do in the woods and nutrients is deposited into the uh, inside of the woods or into the natural environment. Um, macroinvertebrates, these small little um, insects or insect larvae, they will biodegrade these fish. They will, they will eat them. They will break them down. And same thing, then those, um, those macroinvertebrates or those small uh, insects get larger and then they supply food to other fish or other birds. Uh, so these salmon are very important for the ecosystem as a whole. So river requirements for young salmon. So this is something important for us to kind of keep in the back of our mind as we start talking about where we'll be releasing our salmon. Um, it's important for us to realize that there's certain requirements that have to be present in order for our salmon to be able to survive. So food, macroinvertebrates are uh, the big one. Salmon are opportunistic, uh, meaning that they basically just sit in the current, they wait patiently, and as soon as a uh, bug or insect or other object comes floating by, they will um, they'll just grab it. Uh, there needs to be some shelter. So this bottom picture, you can see where there's a couple undercut banks. Um, they need to have some area where they can stay away from predators and undercut banks and... and um, vegetation and rocks and large boulders and things like that supply quite a bit of structure for um, these young salmon to survive, to eat, and to grow. Uh, and then temperature. Temperature is a very important one and this is something that we will have to monitor on our fish tank very often. Um, we will have to make sure that the water temperature uh, needs to be when, when we first get our eggs, it needs to be 42 degrees Fahrenheit. As our eggs hatch and as they get a little bit bigger, uh, we can slowly increase the water temperature. We can even get it up into the low 60s and they'll be perfectly fine. But um, we need to keep the temperature pretty cold to begin with because uh, if we don't, then development of cells happens a little bit quicker um, and those, those fry can actually hatch a little bit too early if the temperature is too hot. Uh, river requirements for reproduction uh, must be some cold flowing water. There has to be adequate gravel so that then when reproduction is occurring, uh, those eggs can be deposited underneath that gravel. There needs to be some shelter from predators. So for example, fishermen. Um, it's a good thing to have some overhanging vegetation for reproduction so they aren't constantly being bugged by uh, fishermen. Um, and then Outside of that as well, think about um, predator birds like eagles. Um, it makes a pretty easy meal when you're in three inches, four inches of water and you are easy to see and an eagle's really hungry. So looking for some overhanging vegetation uh, to help protect you or some deeper pools that the fish can spawn in where they're not as easily seen. Uh, and then also the water has to be uh, navigatable. Uh, meaning that 
there can't be dams in the way. Obviously, there can't be some object blocking the migration of those fish from where they live and grow, uh, for example, the Great Lakes, into um, up and into the river systems. So uh, you need to have some navigatable water, uh, which allow f uh, some larger bodies or have some larger bodies of water for those fish to be able to uh, grow up to adult size. Water quality is important as well. Uh, water needs to be cold, clear. Um, that must be the case both in the, in the Great Lakes and also in the river systems. Uh, so it's important to note that our Great Lake ecosystem is a pretty, uh, pretty perfect ecosystem for these fish to, to thrive. Uh, ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite must mostly be absent. Uh, we don't want high concentrations of ammonia, nitrate, and nitrite. So it's important to pay attention to that. And then we need to have abundant dissolved oxygen. Um, salmon, in particular, their metabol metabolic rate is extremely high. So it's important for them to have a large amount of dissolved oxygen inside of the water so that then they can constantly get the nutrients that they need, the oxygen that they need uh, from breathing. And then there needs to be minimal pollution. Obviously, we know that if we have excess pollution in any environment, it's detrimental to any living thing. Uh, some of the salmon predators that exist inside of our, um, inside of our Great Lakes ecosystem uh, would be the eagle, um, large predator fish like uh, other trout, uh, pike, um, and a number of other species as well. Wolves in the uh, Upper Peninsula, um, that's an area where there's uh, wolf populations and those wolves will scavenge and will eat salmon uh, during the fall when they run. So wolves are definitely a predator species. There's a few small mammals that are also predator species. Typically a salmon will have to be pretty weak and be done spawning before some of the smaller mammal species can get to them. Um, this picture right here shows a, a grizzly bear eating a salmon. Salmon is jumping right into the grizzly bear's mouth. Um, obviously, we don't have grizzly bears in the Great Lakes region, but uh, we do have bears, black bears specifically, that uh, do eat salmon as well. So that's something to be aware of. And then finally, fishermen. Fishermen are predators. Um, salmon are tasty. You know, a lot of people like them, so uh, we try to fish for them. And we're taking them out of the natural environment before they're able to uh, reproduce. Then we're kind of inhibiting that population of the fish um, on a natural level. Um, salmon predators slash uh, fry or fingerlings. Um, so some of the predators that are for um, fry or fingerlings. Uh, and we'll talk specifically about the area that we're going to be releasing um, our, our fry. Uh, we'll be releasing them in Fish Creek over by Hubbardston. Um, so some of the predators that exist there are going to be humans, fishermen, for example. Uh, there's eagles in that area, there's hawks, there's mink, otter, turtles, snakes, and a variety of fish species as well. So this picture right here just shows a whole bunch of fish species. Not all of these will be found in that ecosystem, um, but a number of them will be. And, and uh, any larger fish is going to try to feed on a smaller fish. So uh, it's important to realize that if there's any large size fish in that area, there is a chance that they will try to um, to prey on our on our fingerlings or on our fry. That concludes uh, this PowerPoint. Concludes the lesson that I have on kind of introduction to this project. Um, it's important to be very uh, open as far as thinking about how we're going to go about performing some experiments that we perform. Uh, it's also important to keep excellent notes. Um, be flexible with me because uh, there will be some things that will change this year. Not everything's going to be the same from last year. We'll give you as much data as we can from last year's project and year, year's previous project, but we always seem to have some changes. Uh, so I do ask you guys to be a little bit flexible. Some things might not be exactly as what you heard they were like um, last year. So uh, I will leave you with a picture of a fish smashing through a building.